Namaste. So today we continue with the description of Atma Vichara given in Sri Aparokshanubhuti. Aum Nahang Bhutagano Deho Nahang Chakshaganashtata Etad Vilakshana Kaschid Vichara Soyamidrishaha Naham, I am not. Bhutaganaha, combination of the elements. Dehaha, the gross body. Naham, I am not. Cha, and. Ukshaganaha, aggregate of the senses the subtle body. Tata, therefore, etad vilakshanaha, different from these, kashchit, something, vicharaha, self-inquiry, soyang, etc., idrishaha, endowed with such qualities. I am neither the body a combination of the five elements of matter, nor am I the aggregate of the senses. I am something different from these. This is the way of that vichara. Ajnana prabhavang sarvang jnana pravilyate sankalpo virha karta vichara soyamidrasaha Ajnana Prabhavam, produced by ignorance, Sarvam, everything, Jnanena, through realization, Praviliyate, completely disappears, Sankalpaha, thoughts, Vividaha, various, Karta, creator, Vicharaha, self inquiry, Soyam, etc., idrishaha, endowed with such qualities. Everything is produced by ignorance and dissolves in the wake of realization. The various thoughts, modifications of antakarna, must be the creator. Such is this vichara. So, this and the succeeding verses describe the nature of Atma Vichara. It's not limited to the question of who am I? It also has to deal with the nature of the world that we find ourselves in. Because the two questions are so closely interrelated, they're practically the same thing. Since the ego identifies the body and the mind as the self, self with a small s, when the self with a capital S wants to awaken, the first thing we have to inquire into is, who am I? Am I this body and mind? Am I part of this universe which is produced from ignorance? Or am I something more than this? Am I the subtle mind, the modifications of the antakarana or internal organ? Or am I even beyond that? So these are the questions that one has to answer. And I love the comment that Richard Clark made, which brought up the fact that simple book knowledge, verbal knowledge, Knowledge of words and symbols will not bring about the desired result. First, the mind has to be purified by obtaining the qualifications or prerequisites discussed in previous videos. And then, a specific technique has to be used, not simply thinking about these questions, but making them a lived experience. Now, how do we do that? Somebody's always going to ask this. How do we do that? <laughs> the, 
When we come to this question, let's use who am I as an example. It's not that we take up who am I as a mantra, huh? chant it on beads, who am I, who am I, who am I? <laughs> or try to resolve the question through discussions or research or, in other words, book knowledge. But no, we have to confront Maya. That's the point I made in yesterday's video. Here. One has to confront Maya with the question, who am I really? How do you do that? All right. You have to take a stand. First of all, who is asking the question? Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am the self, with a capital S. And I want to know who I really am, Maya. Huh? We're addressing Maya directly as the self. We are the self, and we're asking her. Answer directly. Answer, give me a straight answer. The way we do that is to stand in the space of the question. In other words, it's not simply about thinking. It's about feeling, about being. We take a stand as Brahman in the question, who am I? Or what is this universe? Or any of the other questions that we can investigate? And we stick to it. It's a meditation. It's not thinking. It's being. Standing in the space of the question means to saturate the mind, saturate the consciousness with the question. Until that's the only thought in the mind. This may take some time. It may take a lot of time. But one has to contemplate the question until it becomes one's very being. And then, forget about it. <laughs> this is often the most difficult part. Once the consciousness has been saturated with the question, once the question has become one's very being, one has to be able to walk away from it, unconcerned, and go on with one's daily business not even waiting, not, not with any sense of expectation, but really simply walk away from the question, drop it. And what we usually find is the answer will pop up at some unexpected moment. This is very Zen. This is the way the Zen masters taught Zen through koans. Take a koan, like what is the sound of one hand clapping? It's obviously is a nonsense question, right? On the face of it. But if you meditate deeply on this question, and then let it go, suddenly the answer will come. Not as an intellectual uh, verbiage, but as a state of being, a state of consciousness, beyond the mind. That's what we're looking for. And when this hits, you're just floored, you're overwhelmed. You're like, wow. See, and this ensures that the answer is correct. Because the mind can always speculate and imagine and hallucinate all kinds of nonsense. But if the answer comes in the form of a state of being beyond the mind, 
then we know it's authentic. Let me give you an example. One time, I think it was about 1986, I was on Guam, an island in the South Pacific. I had had my first path experience in 1984, and I was still trying to figure it out. And anyway, I got into the question, what does the world look like from God's point of view? And I sat or stood in this question for, I think, a couple of weeks. I was obsessed with it. I thought of it the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night. And by the way, this is a tip. If you want to think a certain thought the first thing in the morning, keep it in your mind as you go to sleep at night. Because you go into sleep and come out by the same door. So if you leave a thought there, when you come out of sleep, it'll be there waiting for you. This is a good tip. Another good tip is to stand in the question. Let it sink in. Let it go deep. Then, finally, walk away. Just forget about it. So I actually did this with this question. What does the world look like from God's point of view? I steeped my mind in this question for a couple of weeks, just obsessed with it night and day. And then I dropped it. I forgot about it. I went free diving in the, in the lagoon, <laughs> you know. I took long walks by the beach. And on one of these walks, one very hot day, I was walking along and I picked my foot up to take a step. And suddenly I was in a different world. I was in a hand, a giant hand. Huh? I was like a little ant in the palm of this gigantic hand. And the hand was accelerating upwards. And so I was kind of dizzy, you know, I had like vertigo for a while because of the acceleration and the height and everything. Finally, after what seemed like a long time, the hand stabilized. It was still. And so I very cautiously crawled over to the edge and looked over. And what did I see? I saw the earth from like, must have been hundreds of miles high. And I saw the ocean and I saw the island where I was staying. And on the island, I saw the beach where I had been walking. And the waves crashing on the beach. And suddenly a great voice filled my mind that Every drop of water in that ocean is a living soul. And every grain of sand on that beach is a world. Boom. So then, <laughs> as if that wasn't enough, <laughs> the hand in which I was crawling o over to the edge here, huh? began to turn and I came face to face with God. What did I see? I saw Brahman. Brahman was so attractive, just a light, <laughs> just a light, just an infinite light of infinite consciousness and bliss <laughs> and so attractive. I mean, I couldn't tear my mind away from it. It was so beautiful. And I felt myself drawn towards it, like I just wanted to dissolve into it, you know? And suddenly, boom, I came out of the vision 
just in time for my foot to hit the ground on the next step. In other words, the whole vision, which seemed like it took maybe 10 or 15 minutes of subjective time, actually took less than a second of objective time, world time. But boy, did I get my question answered? You bet. And there was no way that this could have come from the mind. Because the mind could never imagine the beauty of Brahman, the beauty of God, the authentic God. Not some anthropomorphic projection, huh? or some philosophical speculation, some word knowledge. Huh? This was the real thing. I felt it deep in my bones, you know, in my heart. So this is the kind of metacognition that we're talking about with Atma Vichara. To put oneself in the space of the question for long enough that one becomes the state of being necessary to answer that question. And of course, with ultimate questions like, who am I? That means to realize Brahman. Aum Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.